Well, uh, it, it's an honor to introduce uh, a poet, a scholar, and somebody who's worked uh, extensively in the field of uh, in the field of field for Indian literature. Long time editor of the magazine for Indian literature. Somebody who is also associated with my uh, old uh, late lamented teacher, Minakshi Mukherjee. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think K. Uh, Sachidananda needs any uh, extensive uh, introduction, but uh, I should just mention a couple of things uh, which uh, some of you may, may be unaware of, which is to say that in the Kerala context, he is somebody who has been very close to uh, people's movements. His poetry is, is widely read. Uh, he is considered to be one of the great modernists in that, uh, in, in that part of uh, in, in the Malayalam language. Uh, but uh, apart from his uh, many achievements in uh, the Malayalam language, he is also one of the most well-known translators in the country. <coughs> translated from Malayalam into English and, 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 and vice versa. So, uh, apart from which, he is also uh, a much travelled uh, uh, poet. And so therefore, uh, he brings to us much wisdom from all that wide uh, experience. So we're really looking forward to listening to him. He's actually something of an in-house speaker because he's intimately involved uh, with. Uh, he's been intimately involved with the setting up of uh, the school right from day one, and uh, so it's, uh, it's it's with great pleasure that uh, I recommend you to see this. And went through the hole 
and going down, he reached the netherworld. And the <coughs> there's a lot of details which I am not going into. When he was falling down, the king's cooks in the kitchen saw this strange beast coming down, a very small one, and they thought that uh, their king, who relish fresh non-vegetarian delicacies, would perhaps like this little animal which has never been seen before. And so they caught this little beast and put him on the platter along with his dinner. So when the king sat for dinner, he heard someone whisper from the plate, wrong, wrong, wrong. He, he looked closely and he found that it was coming from a small animal on the plate. And he asked him, who are you? How did you come here? And Hanuman said, uh, yes, I am, I am the messenger of Sri Ram. He lost his ring and it seems that we hold the ring came here and fell down here. I would like to get it back. The king who had a lot of respect for Ram and also had heard of Hanuman, took him along and put in front of him a huge platter full of rings, thousands of rings. And he asked Hanuman to pick up the particular ring that belonged to his particular Ram. And Hanuman found it exceedingly difficult because he never knew that there have been so many Rams and there are going to be so many Rams in future. And so he was disappointed, he couldn't get it. But the king had said, don't worry because by the time you go back, your Ram will already have disappeared. He would, he would have, he would have uh, ascended, ascended, uh, gone to heaven and uh, uh, Lava and Pusha will be ruling Ayodhya. Hanuman went back and found uh, it was true, the king really knew that uh, the end of this particular Ram had come. Of course, Ramanujan tells us this story as a kind of preface to his well-known and well-researched work Three, uh, 300 Ramayanas, uh, which of course, <laughs> which also was, as you may well know, uh, much controversial and which came to be banned shamefully in the Delhi University because some people <coughs> did not want it to be banned. Some people believe that India has only a single tradition, a single Ramayana, a single Rama, a single religion, did not want it to be taught in the university and the well, uh, the Senate and all, all those people are going the pressure and they decided to ban or to at least to, to withdraw 300 Ramayanas uh, from the syllabus. But I, I, I remember the story because this in some sense is also a metaphor for what we often in singular call Indian literature. If this is the case of Ramayana, a single text, you can imagine how many texts in the literature must have produced over the ages and how many forms, how many incarnations, how many kind of songs in the literature has existed over centuries. And so the question is legitimate whether uh, Indian literature is one, is it, uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it singular or is it plural. Since I was mentioning Ramayana, I would also like to make a <coughs> reference to some of the Ramayana tradition. I'm going into it at length. I'm sure you are familiar with the work of Father Kamil Bulke and of Paul uh, Richman, two of the greatest Ramayana scholars from outside, who have done a lot of research on the, on the Ramayana tradition in South Asia because it is not purely Indian tradition, it is a South Asian, South Asian tradition. So we have oral Ramayanas, we have performed Ramayanas, we have written Ramayanas and uh, all these Ramayanas have only something in common that is there is a Ram, there is a Ravan, there is a battle not necessarily between Ram and Ram, in some cases not so there is Sita and Sita is uh, carried off by Ravan and finally uh, retrieved uh, to a, 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 a battle What of these essential elements there is hardly anything in common among these different Ramayanas. 
And remember, each language has many Rama. The Rama has 28 Rama, actually. And, and this is true of most of the languages of India. And then there are unwritten Ramayanas, folk and tribal Ramayanas, which uh, depict the Rama story in uh, altogether, uh, altogether different ways. There is a, there is a Jain Ramayana, the Bhavacharya, where uh, Rama is a lady, lady Jain monk, and who, uh, 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 Rama is a Jain monk, and who is a victim of, uh, of passion. He is presented like a Greek tragic figure, not uh, somebody to be pitied rather than despised. And you, you find that also in the Tamil drama, in, in, in Kamba, Ravan is a kind of uh, a great hero. He, as you perhaps know, he is a wild, a great Vina player, and also uh, a great Bhakta, a devotee of, uh, of Shiva, and a very great uh, scholar. Uh, so uh, Kamba treats Ravan with a lot of, uh, lot of reverence. And, uh, and, and in, in Kamba, as in some of the Ramayanas, Ravan deliberately carries Sita off so that he may be killed by Ram and he may attain moksha. It is a deliberate act on his part and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't touch uh, uh, Sita knowing uh, how pure uh, she is. And, and there, are, uh, there, are, there are Ramayanas where uh, uh, Sita is Ravan's uh, Where Sita is a Ravan's daughter. There is one Ramayana where actually Ravan conceives, uh, conceives Sita uh, in the, I mean, it's, it's a Canada folk Ramayana where uh, Rama is a, I mean, uh, uh, Ravan is a kind of uh, uh, cross dresser. And so when he is dressed as Ravula, a woman, uh, she or he conceives uh, uh, Sita. Uh, so, so, uh, and so he is punished actually for incest there because uh, he, uh, he falls in love with uh, uh, his own daughter. It's an Oedipal situation where uh, finally he is, uh, he is punished for that. And uh, uh, there, there is the Thai Ramayana which is called uh, uh, Ramkian or uh, Ramkirti where, uh, Rama, uh, where Ravana's wife takes rice uh, brought to her by uh, by a dog from a uh, from a bowl of rice, it is received by Dashrath after a sacrifice, and Rama there is a precursor of Devadatta. Uh, Rama uh, is a precursor of the Buddha, and Ravana uh, is the precursor of Devadatta. With whom you you remember the story? They had a, a, a quarrel when uh, a, a dog was killed, and uh, and then Devadatta claimed it, uh, but then Buddha wanted to. Uh, heal uh, it of its wounds and uh, get the dove back. So, uh, so Devadatta and Buddha, uh, like Rama and Ravana, are supposed to be uh, the incarnations of uh, uh, Vasudeva and Prati Vasudeva. These are two uh, recurring figures in Jain uh, mythology, where Vasudeva stands for uh, all great virtues, and Prati Vasudeva always gives him a challenge, birth after birth, birth after birth. And, and you have also the Buddha, the Buddhist uh, uh, Ramayana is called the Dasharatha Jataka, where Buddha is the narrator of the, of the, of the tale, and Rama, uh, Rama is an incarnation of the, uh, of the Bodhisattva. And uh, Ravan poses a kind of threat to the order. And after the battle, Rama establishes his benevolent kingdom in Benares, according to uh, the Buddhist Ramayana. While according to La La uh, Ramayana in Laos, uh, Rama's kingdom is somewhere in Laos. It's a city, it's in, a city in, uh, in, in Laos. So I was just giving some examples, but there are all kinds of Ramayanas where characters are uh, delineated in different fashions. Episodes are uh, described in uh, very, very, very different ways, uh, and events sometimes are added, sometimes uh, uh, taken out, and, and so in each language you find uh, 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 several Ramayanas which present the uh, story, the basic story, uh, in so many diverse and uh, different fashions. There are also women's Ramayana. Telugu uh, has a women's Ramayana where a lot of importance is given to Sita and uh, uh, where you know, her pregnancy, her labor, all these are described in daily detail because for a woman these are some of the major events in their uh, uh, personal life. And, and, and there are other, there are, there are, uh, in, in Kerala recently uh, someone has discovered and narrated a Mapilla Ramayana 
a Muslim Ramayana uh, and also a tribal Ramayana where Sita is a tribal woman and Rama meets her when uh, she comes down from a mountain carrying a, a basket of firewood and they, they fall in love. So, so, so in, in short, uh, uh, Rama, the, story, the Ramayana story has been a site uh, of play for Indian imagination. And uh, writers and singers and performers have gone on uh, uh, reenacting Ramayana in their own different ways, projecting their memories, their dreams, their understanding of life into this basic narrative of, of, of Ramayana. So there have been, in short, there have been uh, so many Ramayanas, and I remember uh, Indusa Hussain, uh, who I know very well, and is a great uh, Pakistani writer. Once said when when Babri Masjid was uh, uh, raised uh, the ground, uh, he said, uh, "Well, uh, until now, Ayodhya to me was uh, a land of imagination. I never knew, I never thought of Ayodhya as a uh, as a place on the map. But now it has been reduced to a small uh, play uh, place somewhere in Uttar Pradesh in the uh, in the uh, on the Indian map." So, so actually speaking, Ayodhya has been and the, and the whole of Ramayana has been a site of imagination rather than a, a small, simple uh, site of some real events uh, take, taking place. And so you know, I, 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 I went through some of these Ramayanas in brief only to say how, how various uh, our, uh, uh, our Ramayana tradition is, how many stories, how many episodes, how many different kinds of versions it has had, and even today it goes on inspiring imagination in different ways. And there's a whole book, the tradition of uh, interrogating Ramayana, what are the what are book is called questioning Ramayana, a South Asian tradition. Uh, so, uh, and, and even today it goes on, because Ramayana is narrated from the point of view of Sita, who is abandoned, uh, you know, by, by Rama, and so there are uh, feminists who question Rama's sense of justice, and sometimes it is narrated from the point of Shambhuga, who was uh, killed by uh, Rama, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 it, was, it again questions Rama's sense of karma, because he was killed only because he was uh, a Shudra, uh, and the great play by Uwebu called Shudra Tapasvi where he reverses the, uh, the whole, uh, whole story, uh, where the arrow meant for Shambhuga uh, hits uh, the Brahmin who had complained against, against Shambhuga. So in short, there have been uh, thousands of ways in which the story of Rama has been narrated. Uh, uh, it has been, I mean, and as I said, it has, uh, it has uh, from time to time reflected the Indian mind, uh, its, uh, its aspirations, uh, its, uh, its, its sense of reality, and also its uh, various kinds of uh, uh, fantasies. Now, I, I would also uh, try to, of course, of course, one can go, one can also enter Mahabharata and come out with so many versions of Mahabharata. And the Mahabharata is also now uh, interrogated, take, uh, reading it from the point of view of Ekalavya, who was denied education, uh, as, as many of the Dalit writers have done. But, but we, we, shall, uh, we shall now perhaps ask, the, ask this question uh, again, uh, whether Indian uh, literature is a singular or plural. And this question has been, responded to differently by different thinkers. We had S. Rathakushan, as you know, a philosopher president of India, who once said that uh, Indian literature is one, even though written in different languages. And that uh, Sahitya Academy had adopted it as, a, as its uh, kind of uh, maxim. I was doubtful when I said that I, I did not use it anymore. Anyway. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, uh, so that is one way of looking at Indian literature as one, even though it is written in different languages. So uh, why, uh, why uh, we cannot accept it in total, we shall, we shall uh, shortly discuss. And the second is the opposite point of view. Some uh, people who say that there is nothing like Indian literature. There was a great Bengali critic, Nihar Ranjan Ray. Where he said, that literature is always known by the language in which it is written and so there is no single language called Indian and hence there cannot be an Indian literature. There can only be Indian literatures if at all you want to you use the term. That was a, uh, that was a, a kind of second uh, proposition that the Bengali critic had. But again this, uh, this, uh, this can be to a great extent question uh, because it is not right to say that 
or maybe literatures that are known by the name of the languages. You can give both kinds of examples. Uh, when, when you speak of uh, Latin American literature, for example, you are not speaking, you are not na uh, using the name of any particular language, but the, or European literature, or American literature, with, with all of, uh, of which we are familiar, so we are not using the name of any, any language. On the other hand, uh, if you look at English literature, in fact, uh, there is Indian English literature, Australian literature, most of it is, uh, is in English, uh, American literature is in English, and Canadian literature, partly in English and partly in French. So, so it is also possible that literatures uh, that belong to the same language can also be known by different names. So there is uh, clearly a flow in that logic which denies uh, any possibility of an, uh, of an Indian, uh, Indian literature. And also we know that if, uh, uh, there have been other ways in which literature uh, has been and can be, uh, can be looked at from the point of view of its structure, from the, uh, from the uh, point of view of, uh, of, of, of uh, some uh, psychoanalysis like uh, Freud has done or later uh, Lacan has done uh, or and, uh, you know, Piaget and uh, uh, other different people have looked at uh, literature from the structural, structuralist point of view and uh, uh, from the gender point of view as feminists do uh, like uh, Elaine Showalter or Elaine uh, Zixu, a lot of uh, major uh, feminist thinkers have looked at evaluated literature, looked at literature from a, a woman's or gender point of view, and then from the, uh, the, the, uh, the point of view of the blacks or the point of view of, of the Dalits, because there is a whole new Dalit aesthetics which is coming up in India in a, in a big way, uh, or, or, or on which uh, Sharan Kumar Limbale has written a whole book uh, called uh, Dalit Aesthetics, and, and, uh, and also from the point of view of the connections between knowledge and the power, as perhaps uh, Michel Foucault tries to do from the point of view of the, of the symbols and the archetypes or from the point of view of the contradictions which are inherent in the text and which can be developed so that finally the text itself gets exploded and deconstructed as Derrida tries to do with the many of the important uh, classical texts. So there, there are various ways in which uh, you know, uh, literature can be looked at, can be evaluated, can be, can be read and again if you look at Indian literature particularly, it has seldom been monolingual. Multilingualism, Aigar Haman in one of his famous essays on Indian literature says, multilingualism and polyglot fluidity have been two of the major characteristics of uh, Indian, Indian literature. Uh, because uh, many of our writers uh, do not belong to one language, especially if you if you go back to the past. Uh, so, so look at some, someone like Mirabai. Mirabai is claimed by Hindi, by Gujarati, by Rajasthani, and, and, and that can be said about many other writers like uh, Guru Nanak, for example, who wrote in uh, no, no, who wrote or, or, or sometimes sang in various languages like Persian and Sanskrit, and uh, and Kafi and Laguri. And you have uh, you, uh, you have someone like uh, Vidyapati who wrote in Sanskrit and also uh, <coughs> and in Maithili and in, in modern times also you have writers like Ekai Ramanda himself and the three languages very easily and moved uh, uh, easily from one to the other as these uh, earlier poets did or as did uh, Kabir or, uh, or Namdev uh, who would use Punjabi and uh, Hindi for a particular kind, mostly Braj in, uh, in their uh, poetry. Uh, and uh, so you have Jaita Mahavatra writing in Korea and English simultaneously. We have Kamala Das who write stories in Malayalam and poetry in English. So the uh, bilingual, trilingual and multilingual tradition continues even today, even though it has become weak for reasons that we know because we are perhaps becoming unfortunately more and more monolingual uh, uh, with, uh, in the aftermath of colonial domination and, the, uh, and uh, uh, English seems to be taking over. Uh, the, the danger of uh, our, our language is uh, uh, getting weaker and, and even uh, disappearing. But, the, the, but the, uh, the whole tradition actually rests on uh, multilingualism and this easy passage between one language and another. Writers uh, are almost unconsciously when they move from one region to another, uh, someone like Kabir, he would sing and he would, uh, when he moved to another region, he would uh, automatically uh, fix the language and, and begin to sing in another language. So this has been in fact a part of our tradition. So we cannot look at Indian literature from the point of view of the monolinguals, of the people who have only a, a single, uh, single language. 
And there have, uh, there have also been uh, periods when we will, we will soon come to that, when Indian literature, uh, the Indian literature came together, exchanged notes and uh, borrowed uh, from uh, one another, forms, modes of looking at reality, uh, forms, of, uh, forms of perception, uh, mediums, uh, and various kinds of uh, literary forms and uh, from, uh, forms and genres. And also, India had been, to a great extent, a cultural, a cultural unity even before it became a political unit under the under under the British, because there are references to uh, Bharat Varsha in ancient uh, uh, scriptures. It is there in Vishnu Purana, for example. It is there in uh, Amir Khusru, in in Shankardev of Assam, in Kalidasa's Meghadud. So you find uh, as an imaginary realm. India, some kind of India, had existed even before it became a political uh, political unit, and, and and forms, as I said, you know, uh, if you look at uh, various kinds of forms, modern forms like elegy or sonnet or hymn or uh, older forms like uh, like the version from Ghazal or Baramasa or uh, Champu, Doha, Masnavi, a lot of forms. They are not found in all the languages, but they are found in quite a few of the languages, uh, languages of India. And again, the uh, uh, critical categories in many, uh, cutting across languages, in many, at least of the mainstream languages, we find two major sources of critical categories. One is, of course, Sanskrit, using, uh, you know, concepts like uh, Twenty and Makropi and Anumana and Ressa, and quite a lot of uh, major concepts that come from uh, especially from Bharata and Handavartana, but also Mamata and Mahimakata and uh, quite a lot of other Puntaka and a lot of other uh, theoreticians. And another source has been the West, Europe in general, first uh, England and then uh, mainly France. So we have been using a lot of French and German concepts in analyzing literature, understanding literature, evaluating uh, literature. So if you look at these critical categories, again you find a lot of Indian languages use the same kind of uh, categories across uh, across languages. And uh, so I am looking at the possibility of unity, and then of course we will also problematize a bit. Uh, and then uh, if you look at the patterns of uh, evolution, that is the, the major moments of the history of uh, Indian literature, again you will find there have been periods when, as I earlier said, they, there were a lot of exchanges but there have also been periods when uh, certain uh, literatures grew independent of all other uh, literatures. Uh, you know, I am again not going into the uh, history of 5,000 years of Indian literature, but I would say that uh, we had, for example, uh, a, a major period when of uh, tribal and oral literature, to which uh, science literature also belongs, and Vedas and Upanishads to me are part of tribal literature, even though, of course, uh, now uh, we uh, see it as uh, Brahmanical and all that. But uh, they were nothing but tribes, the Gopras, the tribes, which created all these uh, ancient, uh, major ancient texts. And uh, the, uh, then uh, we have the, uh, a, the great period of uh, uh, epic, epics of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and also several parallel epics which have been marginalized by Ramayana and Mahabharata, which is also equally important because you had something like Malle Madeshwara in, in, in Kannada folk tradition. Uh, 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 you had several tribal, more than a hundred tribal epics, which are seldom written down, but even today, uh, very often they are recited for 10 days, for some, sometimes for a whole month. They remember these uh, epics and they recite them. So when, when I speak of the epic tradition, I am not speaking only of Mahabharata or Ramayana or Bhagavata, but also of of these uh, more than 100 epics in different uh, uh, mainstream and uh, marginalized languages of, of India. So there is a, a, a peri that the period of the various kinds of, of, uh, of epics. And then there is a there is a period when Sanskrit literature became extremely uh, you know uh, dominant, uh, at least from the uh, 3rd century to the 14th century AD, perhaps that was the period when Sanskrit uh, gained a kind of predominance. When we had poets like uh, you know, Kardasa and Bhavsa and Varahira and Shudraka, uh, uh, and so we had uh, uh, we had a text 
which often depicted the life of the upper classes, but we have also texts uh, like uh, 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 like so Prachakadika, for example, which dealt with the life of the common people uh, in India. Uh, even though the, those texts have often again been forgotten or, or marginalized. There were a lot of poets like Yogeshwara who spoke the pains of the peasants and the poor people, uh, which again you don't you don't hear of Yogeshwara when you speak of Sanskrit literature. You hear only of Kalidasa or Bhasa and all those people in the main tradition. So one has to uh, take a second look at the at the tradition in order to retrieve these uh, suppressed or lost voices uh, in the uh, in the in the Indian in the tradition. So when, and, and when Sanskrit was dominant, generally speaking, uh, in the south and also in the north. We also had a parallel stream of, uh, uh, you know, Buddhist and uh, Jaina literatures. We had Vasudeva Hindi. Uh, we had we, uh, we had uh, Shanti Deva and Adi Deva, several uh, Jain and uh, Buddhist writers. Uh, and at the same time, in the south, uh, you know, the period of the Sangam literature with the great, uh, you know, uh, there, there, there were epics uh, uh, and uh, and uh, there were also a lot of uh, uh, songs or small lyrics. You know, there were se several uh, books like uh, like Padinti Patu and Pranayu and Atananuru, which are collections of uh, collections of songs or lyrical kinds of poems. Uh, and there was, of course, Mani Megale and there was Chirapadigaram, which were two of the major uh, Tamil uh, Tamil epics. So that is a period when uh, that, 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 that I gave you this is an example of a period when uh, literatures uh, also uh, seem to be developing independently. Because the Tamil has a tradition which is completely independent of uh, of Sanskrit, uh, which has its own aesthetics, uh, which is a kind of uh, eco aesthetics based on the ecological principles <coughs> of nature, like the like Tinais. and and its uh, its poetics is very different from uh, the known uh, uh, Sanskrit poetics. So, so, so uh, Tamil had a kind of independent role. It, it had its own uh, forms of poetry. Its own. Uh, I'm not going into all the Venpa and Kalipa. Even the it had its own uh, its own form of a lullaby. So there have been meet, uh, independent Dravidian meters, Dravidian uh, forms which Tamil developed, uh, which were completely independent of uh, the Sanskrit tradition. So, the, so that's the uh, one example of a period when. Uh, languages were also trying to develop independent of uh, of one another, in spite of the various give and takes in the previous ages. But again, you find all the Indian literatures, uh, at least a, a good part of Indian literature, is coming together during the period of what is called the uh, the bhakti, uh, the period of the devotional literature, uh, which uh, I think starts from the seventh century. Uh, to the 19th century. I mean, it, it, it covers a long kind of uh, period in the history of Indian literature. Uh, and Bhakti literature was, in fact, a kind of uh, uh, literature revolt because, for the first time, poets who were also believers, uh, because that was the language in which they could speak about equality at that time, they began to speak about uh, uh, the hu basic human equality. And the reason mainly was this, that most of the Bhakti poets okay, were craftsmen, many of them belonged to the minorities, many of them were the so-called untouchables in the society or who were kept away from the, from the, from the mainstream, they were uh, ordinary workers and so they could imagine only an egalitarian religion where there would be no differences of caste and not even of religion in the insular sense of the word. Because even, even religion to them did not mean religion in the institutional sense in which we, we speak of it today. It was only one form of uh, understanding the universe, one form of uh, relating oneself to the mystery of the universe and uh, not, not, not precisely uh, the kind of institution that we find today with all its uh, you know, priesthood and all that. So the Bhaktas mostly rejected priesthood. They revolted against the domination of uh, Brahminical ideology. They, they uh, rejected Sanskrit and began to uh, write in the regional languages and uh, what are sometimes called the dialects. Well, the difference is small. When a dialect gets an army and a, and, uh, and a political party, it becomes a language. That is that's what even the linguists uh, would say. So they began to use various kinds of uh, language, I would call them languages rather than dialects, 
So they, they uh, used different languages spoken by ordinary people. They did not write in Sanskrit at all. And they rejected the Gita as the authority of the Gita. And they went back instead to uh, the sources of early egalitarianism, like some of the, like Rigveda, or some of the Upanishads, where human beings were spoken of as belonging to a single race and, uh, race and a single caste. So it, uh, again, I have no time to go into the history of our literature. It begins uh, somewhere in the seventh uh, and eighth centuries uh, from the uh, from the Tamil Shaivites. It begins with them clearly. And uh, in Periya Purana, you find uh, uh, a lot of uh, geographical descriptions of the various uh, Bhakti poets. Uh, and uh, their poetry has been called also uh, an anti brahmanical cycle because it was all a revolt against the domination of one caste over others. It was a call for uh, equality. And uh, they, they, they believe that ultimately man is known by the human body, which in all cl classes, races, and uh, caste is, uh, is the same. So they, they stood for a kind of uh, a, a, a biopolitics, uh, or which later thinkers like Sina and the Guru also understood, where, uh, where the body was the, was, the, was the center and that the norm. And, and if that is so, there is no reason why where there should be any distinction uh, between uh, a man of one caste and of another, of one religion and of another, of one race and of another. So the, the whole of uh, uh, Bhakti was a kind of rebellion against inequality, man-made inequalities and man-made hierarchies of various kinds. And during this whole period, we had uh, literally thousands of uh, poets uh, in all the major uh, major traditions. Uh, you know, right, uh, right from um, Tirumula, uh, the Tamil Shaivite, uh, 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 to uh, we had uh, Andal and uh, are quite a lot of uh, major Vaishnavites and Shaivites uh, in Tamil. We had Vasava and Akamaha Devi and a uh, lot of other people in fact, there are hundreds of uh, uh, same poets in, in Kannada. Uh, I, I, I will not take names because in all the regions of India, you find a lot of poets coming up from, from among the craftsmen, uh, common people, and questioning the existing hierarchies and inequality in the society. So that was one major period when many Indian languages and literatures came together and they began to exchange notes because these poets literally, physically also travel from one place to another and along with that Bhakti also as a movement travel. So it is actually, the whole of Bhakti is a questioning tradition. Many of them rejected, like now they, for example, rejected temples also. He never visited temple and uh, he, uh, he never believed that the God was to be found in the temple. So there was a rejection of, a, of customs, of rituals, of various kinds of superstitions associated with the religions, a rejection of uh, uh, Brahmanism, a rejection of the caste system, a rejection of, uh, of uh, one God who was a superior to everyone, who was completely unattainable. But there was a kind of intimate relationship established between uh, man and God during the period. And that was why they rejected the priesthood. They said, we don't need a priest uh, to officiate, to, to mediate between us. Uh, I, uh, we can talk to God directly. So it was uh, one of the major uh, radical egalitarian movements in the in the history of uh, in the literature that also in some sense established a category which could be at least vaguely there in the Indian uh, in Indian literature. But I can say that it was this concept was founded during this time. But there were, as I said, there were a lot of exchanges happening during uh, this particular period. And then we have uh, the uh, the period of social reform and the anti-colonial movements that happened across the languages uh, uh, in India. Because in every language you find, you find the Vadato or Sudhamani Bharati or Rabindranath Tagore or Masurisla. In all the languages you find a lot of major poets by the time prose was coming up and fiction, uh, uh, I mean, of both kinds, long fiction and short fiction. But also they involved in the languages of India and you, you find uh, uh, the, uh, a kind of anti 
colonial spirit uh, uniting writers from various languages and various regions. And along with that, a, a spirit of social reform, uh, whose books can be found in the Bhakti tradition. Because these poets also question the caste, question the, the narrow definitions of religion and of God, and question the, a lot of uh, social evils that exist in the society, and also interrogate the patriarchy uh, in, their, in their own way. Like in, the poems of Sudan Bihaldi or Nasrul Islam, you find a lot of uh, poems that question uh, the, the, the domination of the male in, uh, in public life and in private life. So, uh, so that, that, that the interrogating tradition uh, which the Bhakti had inaugurated seems to continue during this period of uh, social reform and, uh, the, and the, uh, the freedom struggle uh, from the uh, late 19th century to the uh, first half of the uh, 20th century. Then comes another moment when again languages come together that can be called the more realist moment. In the, in the 1950s and 60s, of course it differed from language to language, uh, many writers felt that the existing language, the existing forms, the existing structures of literature were incapable of expressing the new complexity of life in India because there was urbanization, there were major demographic movements, there was a lot of despair among the young who found the colonial education most often useless. People from the villages were moving on to the cities and, the, and, and values, uh, political values were being eroded. Uh, Gandhi's name was taken but Gandhi's spirit was nowhere uh, in, in the activities of the, of the ruling of, of governance. And so there was a kind of crisis. It was a moral crisis, it was a social crisis, a political and economic crisis, and this crisis uh, created a kind of new complex reality which, which needed a new language to articulate it. And the uh, writers of the uh, late 50s and early 60s were in search of a new, uh, a new language, a new idiom. So you find that you know someone like Nirmal Verma in Hindi or, or uh, someone like uh, Obi Vijayan in Malayalam and, and a lot of one can go on naming these people Gobalakrishna, Adiga or Nagan Baro. So if you look at different languages you find a lot of new writers uh, who are trying to find a new medium and a new form to express the, uh, the, the solitude and the alienation that many of them felt in the crowded cities who were trying also to look at the destruction of the villages and who, some of whom also looked with nostalgia at the rural life uh, that was uh, gradually vanishing uh, from India. So there was, uh, 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 there, it was, it was basically a period of disillusionment, a period of despair and a period also of the discovery of new forms uh, and new idioms uh, and structures uh, or uh, literature. So, uh, poetry was completely renewed, very often they gathered meters and began to use three words and different prose forms and fiction, old, uh, straight, uh, one, uh, single line structures were broken and this as you very well know happened also across the arts. It did not have, it, it was not limited to, uh, because I am discussing literature, I take exams from literature. But as you know, that is a time when uh, in, in, in painting, in sculpture, in architecture, in theatre, in film, new forms were being uh, tried and, uh, and, and a new artists were, uh, were, were Coming up, you know, in all these fields, uh, all these fields, you know, you, you had, you know, you can do Irish Kannada, quite a lot of people uh, coming up uh, in in, in theatre. Uh, you had uh, great uh, painters of the period, uh, uh, right from Johnny Roy. You find a whole ro a whole lot of uh, uh, painters uh, in different parts. Johnny Roy, or Ganesh Pai, or this is funny. So again, I'm not going into names. Uh, all of them were trying to find a new idiom because they, they were not, they were unhappy with the. The realistic kind of idiom that existed until then, they wanted to uh, in, uh, invent uh, new forms and uh, use lines and colors and spaces in absolutely new ways uh, so that they could express their individual imagination and also at the same time renew the social uh, imagination. Because they found that uh, the earlier uh, kind of art had become irrelevant, especially with the invention of the photography and, and uh, the age graduate sophistication. There was no more need to imitate forms as they are. So one has to find a new grammar of forms, and you, you find you find that new grammar of forms emerging in painting, 
and that happens uh, in theatre too. The realistic uh, theatre gets uh, uh, interrogated, and then uh, you you have uh, modern theatre in various forms. Sometimes uh, proscenium theatre, sometimes street theatre, and uh, they they sometimes they bring in folk traditions as uh, as Rabindranath uh, does or Kavana Narayana Panikkar does. Sometimes they bring in classical uh, structures of the ancient Sanskrit drama. Uh, so you, you and, and then new structures which are in the West but not exactly borrowed from the uh, from the West uh, the the absurd or or of course theatre of cruelty and various kinds of forms uh, or or Stanislavski's way of uh, looking at uh, uh, acting and uh, using memory as a major tool for uh, uh, for the for, of the actor. So you find the age was uh, and then we have we had also uh, great uh, filmmakers coming up right from the uh, Ukraine onwards, uh, trying to create again new ways of looking at reality, and also for that a new uh, a, a new way of uh, a, a, a new angle of representing uh, reality. So we had uh, we had many companies, they they are ideolo ideologically they were different. But what united the both is such for the new, making it new, as a Sarpon would say. They are all trying to create some uh, new, new, new film, new theatre, new, new fiction, new poetry. So that was another uh, time when writers and artists of uh, uh, different uh, languages and regions uh, seemed to learn from one another and, uh, uh, and indulge in a kind of, a kind of uh, uh, give, uh, give and take. Uh, of course, just before that, there was, uh, which I know, perhaps there was this period of progressive literature, IPTA, and uh, the, the Gandhians and the Marxists uh, often coming together to uh, to interrogate the uh, existing sense, uh, social, sense of social justice uh, and trying to, for the first time, uh, bring uh, the marginalized to the center stage for grounding the, the poor, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the rural people, uh, the people who were silent so far, invisible so far suddenly become visible and uh, their stories are being told uh, during that period which comes back now in the form of the uh, literature and women's literature and tribal literature. So after modernism, if you look at it, I, I, I would like to make it briefer. Uh, after, after the modern period, again today, if you look at the present uh, state of Indian literature, you will find that uh, uh, there are a lot of common trends emerging. One is, as I said, uh, one, one can be called a kind of progressive modernist literature. Writers who have learned a lot from the ideological orientations of the progressive writers, but have also learned aesthetically from uh, the modern innovations during the modernist period. If you look at a, a poet like, uh, say, Kedarnath Singh uh, or Kumar Narayan or Mandresh Dabral in Hindi, they are modernists. At the same time, they are also progressive in their uh, in their outlook. And you find in all the languages we have writers like that who try to combine a progressive outlook with a uh, modernist kind of idiom. And secondly, of course, I'm simplifying, I know. And secondly, there are the women writers who have come up in dozens in the last. Uh, we always had. We have a whole long tradition, right, the sixth century BC of women's writing, as you as you very well know, right, from. Ubiri and Sumandala and the Buddhist nuns. There's a whole lot to Meera and Nwaka um, uh, Mahadevi and, and then later writers, uh, Mahadevi Varma or Bala Maniyama. So we have, we have a whole tradition. But here the tradition becomes uh, uh, suddenly newly empowered by the feminist ideas of uh, uh, fighting patriarchy and uh, these uh, uh, writers try to in almost invent a new language which has uh, been called by some critics a, a new mother tongue, the, the language of the mother, the language of the of the woman, and so they they are, and they are now looking at myths or uh, the, all the canons of literature in absolutely new ways and reading them from a new point of view, from the woman's point of view. What what, what is Ramayana like? What is Mahabharata like? What and how are the characters being portrayed? And what happens in mainstream literature? So, uh, from the woman's point of view, they are rereading ancient literature and also contemporary literature and trying to interrogate the canons created by the males and also the language structures created by, by the male and trying to uh, create uh, new ways of uh, not only looking at the world but also articulating uh, the, the, their uh, new, way, new, new perceptions of the world. And then there is the literature. 
where again you find a questioning of, of uh, what can be called a kind of uh, upper caste aesthetics because many of the aesthetic norms uh, prescribed in Sanskrit poetics uh, are being questioned. For example, uh, there were certain kinds of words which were not supposed to be used in, uh, in, in literature uh, like Ashlila uh, which means obscene or Gramya which means rural or rustic or Anuchita which is supposed to be improper and but you find a lot of Dalit writers like uh, Namdev Prasad for example who is an imposter, a major Dalit writer and uh, now there are hundreds of such writers in most of the languages of India and all of them seem to be uh, you know uh, uh, questioning the the, the the idea of literary language which is which is really awful. they are also questioning extinct the, the, so, the sense of social justice they are questioning the caste system but along with that they also question the ideas of uh, uh, literature itself question the, the institution of literature itself and so so they reject all these uh, classical injunctions and uh, they use various kinds of uh, words which would have been considered obscene or improper or rural uh, or un uncivilized or uncouth. Uh, uh, they, using these words, they create a new idiom, a new idiom which is close up to the earth, a language that come, emerges out of the slum, out of the, out of the, uh, the hutments in the village, out of the soil, the, the, the soil of the uh, farmland. So they are creating a, uh, not only a new uh, sense of justice, but, a, but also a new idiom and a new understanding of literature uh, itself. And then there are tribal writers who are uh, emerging in many languages like Bibi or Santali or Bodo or Garo or Gamut. I mean, you have, uh, we have uh, so many uh, tribal languages. Uh, tribal people are becoming educated and so now they have discovered that we were the first poets and the first physicians, the first scientists, the first uh, the, uh, dramatists, uh, 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 the, the first philosophers and so there is an assertion of the tribal origins of mankind and there is also a questioning of the marginalization of the tribals for uh, centuries on and so there is a reassertion of uh, tribal life and tribal values in a lot of uh, poetry being written by uh, many of the writers from uh, these, different, uh, these different languages. So once again you find common trends emerging in many of the literatures of uh, literature of India, in India today. So at the same time as, as we have seen if you look closely, all these are being expressed in different ways in different languages. You cannot ignore uh, the differences in the ways in which these common ideas or common attitudes and world views are expressed in literature. You, you will find that uh, 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 the Malayalam Dalit writing is very, very different from, say, Marathi Dalit writing. Uh, the, the idiom being used. The, uh, the way poetry or a short story uh, is being structured is extremely different from uh, the way in which they are being structured in Marathi or in Gujarati. And, and this can be said about all this, uh, women's writing. Even though it looks like there are a lot of common things, it is not the same. It is not. Uh, it is not that the Assamese uh, women's writing and uh, uh, say the uh, women's writing in Rajasthani there, 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 uh, are, 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 are the same, uh, same kind. Well, because because they uh, they also take a lot from the regional traditions, from the linguistic traditions, from the from the milieu, from the from the culture of the region, from the flora and the fauna and ways of life, kin, the different kinds of kinship, different ways uh, in which love is expressed. So there are so many uh, different cultural differences uh, among among us, uh, and these cultural differences also get articulated uh, in the way they express uh, their feminist aspirations or their aspirations or various kinds of uh, progressive aspirations. So there are uh, there, there are common movements, common trends, ideas, but there are also differences which are inevitable being imposed by the uh, different uh, uh, cultures and the languages and you know, social menus from which uh, they, uh, these different writers uh, different writers emerge. So what so, so what so what are we actually uh, driving at? I said there are moments of unity. There are moments of disunity when people, uh, when uh, uh, literatures have been emerging and uh, evolving independently. I said 
there are common orientations and movements, uh, but they are expressed differently in each language depending on the culture and the and the region. So it is impossible, in short, to write a unified history of uh, Indian Indian literature because that so one has to con uh, conceive uh, Indian literature, uh, the unity of Indian literature. At the, if at all you want to use that as a kind of federal unity where regions and cultures and languages have their own independent existence while at the same time at their own volition, at their own will they enter into dialogues and conversations with, uh, uh, with one another. And at a time like this when there is an attempt at uh, monoculturation on uh, uh, developing a kind of cultural amnesia in us, especially by the powers of globalization, when there is a lot of uh, organization happening, when reality which is uh, not calculable is uh, the, the reality which is non-calculable and uh, immeasurable are not considered reality at all because the language of static in the language of statistics you cannot speak about it. So at a time when our own memory is uh, getting eroded and our own cultures and languages are facing a threat, there is a need to reassert the uh, this plurality. Even while speaking of the exchanges, we perhaps need to re-emphasize uh, the diversity and the plurality of cultures and of uh, uh, and of uh, literatures. So, so the so the literature has to be seen finally as a, as, a, as a mosaic, as a mosaic of uh, languages and cultures, of religions and uh, ethnicities, uh, like just as India is. So we need to develop an inclusive concept of uh, nation and also an inclusive concept of uh, Indian literature ultimately, which means there is a need for alternative ideologies, ideologies that overlook the Orientalist notions, uh, the West, uh, old Western notions of India as a as a single uh, unit, uh, because uh, again that uh, uh, right from the dual side, one will have to discuss this uh, uh, this whole history of Orientalism, which tried to reduce India to a single entity, and it spoke of uh, uh, all the people of India as the as as, as the Hindus, uh, or which looked at uh, the Vedas or the Upanishads or the Gita as the or the Manishra, the uh, uh, or, or the or Chanakyas of the Shastra as the major sources of Indian Indian thought, so which, which ultimately was reductive. So one has to overcome that reductivism too, and so we need to develop our own indigenous kinds of uh, approaches and uh, a new kind of indigenous genealogy so that we can go to the deepest springs of uh, our people's imagination and people's creativity. So there is a need for uh, interlinguistic and intertextual studies among the different uh, languages uh, of, of India. Uh, the need for a new cartography marking areas of interaction and areas of uh, isolation, common influences as also the specific patterns. Uh, and so we need, as I said, uh, and we cannot have an integrated history, but we can only have a comparative history. So today when we speak of Indian literature, we need to speak of Indian literature as an area of, uh, of, of, of comparison, of uh, developing a comparative methodology to understand and critique different Indian literatures so that we can take into account the diversity and also we can take into account the unit. You are Anita Murthy, the great Canada writer, who was also the president of the Society Academy, once said, when we look for the unity of Indian literature, we come across its diversity. And we look for the diversity, we come across its unity, which perhaps is a meaningful direct, direct statement about uh, Indian, uh, Indian literature. Because uh, when, you, when we are looking for its uh, great differences, you come across common world views, common movements, common trends. Uh, and when you uh, look for unity, you find how different uh, the Bhakti point of Kabir is from the Bhakti point of Shankardev, or how Shankardev is different from uh, El Dachan, or, or uh, he from Pirumula, uh, or uh, he from uh, Nanaya of, of, uh, of Telugu. So you find that they are all different if you look at them, if you want to look at their differences. 
complexes, but you will also find there were, as I said, certain undercurrents uh, which uh, unite undercurrents, ideological undercurrents, undercurrents of worldviews and attitudes, uh, and attitudes to language, which also in some sense uh, united uh, these poets and brought them together on what uh, in retrospect looks like a common platform. Even though they never knew that they were a part of a movement, we, they call it a Bhakti movement. But the writers themselves never knew that they were uh, they were taking part in a movement because they they, they, they uh, their own aesthetics from their own languages uh, and so on. Uh, they, they did not know it was a movement. Very often uh, the, uh, in literature, movements are a product of retrospection. When you, you go uh, look back, you find modernism also. When uh, I was writing, and Nobel Verma was writing, and somebody else was writing from their own language, we did not know you were taking part in uh, something in common. But then uh, later, looking back, we find yes, perhaps we are all trying to do something similar. We are trying to make it new, create something, something new, something uh, different from what existed traditionally. We were trying to interrogate the, con uh, the conservative understanding of uh, the literary institution and trying to create something new. This you find, as I said, also in various uh, other arts, uh, in, in theatre, in, uh, in film, in all the fields of uh, human activity, this, this constant, uh, constant uh, renewal. Uh, shall, shall I stop here? <laughs> one, one of course, I, I, I was, uh, I, know, I know I was uh, uh, very fast in uh, um, introducing trends and movements, but my idea was only to give you a general idea of uh, how Indian literature uh, can be seen and what are its uh, uh, high points and uh, mo uh, the major uh, moments of uh, evolution and transformation. Thank you so much. Various kinds of texts, including Quran, 
uh, in an attempt to uh, to bring <coughs> communities together and to create a religion that perhaps their dream, their dream would one day become India's religion, where all the religions uh, are released to their brought together and a new kind of religion is uh, created. Of course, now they uh, also uh, had this uh, contribution to uh, this kind of a culture. And in fact, uh, they take off, uh, they, uh, they, uh, Guru Nanak uh, comes uh, squarely in the in the Bhakti tradition uh, because he also uh, was a great interrogator, uh, a, a questioner of existing religious practices and religious values. And he was disillusioned with the, uh, the, the, the way in which religion existed in this time. And that was why he thought of uh, a new kind of religion where uh, the book would be the God, Gantha uh, Sahib, uh, the book would be the God. And where uh, knowledge uh, would be perhaps the, the central quest of all human beings, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, whatever is positive in different religions could be perhaps brought together uh, in the uh, in uh, uh, a, a single understanding of the world.
uh, in, in art and also in social life uh, and uh, and all these artists in in different in their own different ways were trying to challenge the tradition even though they uh, in in the search for the new they went to different uh, sources of inspiration is true but what what uh, united them was this search for the new was this uh, revolt against uh, the existing tradition and uh, the attempt to find a new a new form and redefine and restructure the uh, art that uh, had so far been known as art so uh, because uh, in According to the old canons, many of these may not be considered art, uh, like, like, or, or it is true about it. Uh, when we were writing poetry in the, in the 1960s and all that, many of the conservative critics wouldn't think it was, they wouldn't admit it was poetry because we were not using meter, we were often, we were sometimes using meter, but often rejecting that, we were using new forms, we were reinventing folk forms, and we were, we were using images in new ways, we were looking at life in new patterns, and so they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't acknowledge that it was poetry that we were writing, but uh, gradually, it also was destined to become the mainstream, that is the sad destiny of all, all Arabians. That is the that is literature, for example, it, when it began in Maharashtra, it was a major, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, anti-systemic uh, movement. And now you find that, well, it is accepted by the mainstream. Earlier, the ancient critics would never accept that literature. When Nandir Nazar began to write, Rajiv Dhanwe began to write, they were not accepted. They, uh, uh, but gradually, you find uh, they, are, they are also getting uh, um, you know, acknowledged or, and even canonized. Well, uh, this can this can happen. To, this has happened in the literature uh, because now it is part of uh, university studies and syllabus and all that. So, in some sense, because the establishment has its own way of absorbing and in some sense domesticating even the most uh, uh, radical of, of movements. And uh, uh, movement, it is very difficult for movements to escape that fate. But uh, the only hope we have is that then something still new comes up. That is uh, our hope about man. When the, when the new becomes old, something new again comes up and interrogates the whole thing and again brings about a radical change in the way we uh, experience the world. And that, that, and that that's why, you know, that, that's the great thing about uh, uh, the, the human being, this uh, constant renewal of our perception of the world and, and uh, the constant re, uh, rediscovery of uh, uh, the language to express that. Language means anything, it can be stone, it can be color, it can be word. Shake and then get it. Uh, I was just wondering. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. I was just wondering, sir, if uh, what is this idea? And you finally answered in your last question. What is this idea of newness? Some works last and some works die. 
We know there are various social reasons, you know, that can be, uh, you can deliberately destroy things like uh, most of the anti brahmin uh, things and materialist uh, uh, doctrines that were, uh, you know, burned by people in the past. So that happens. But other than that, what, why is it that uh, some novels, for example, or some of the uh, uh, writings of the past, say, like Mr. Sagali or Shakespeare, uh, or what, what, what is it? That uh, compels the compel, uh, what is uh, if that is compelling in them? Uh, what is it that uh, uh, remains uh, constant in them? And why is it that we are still fascinated? We still the the, the uh, uh, theater director would still like to do uh, some some version, a different version, of course, of of, of Macbeth or of uh, Hamlet or or any other. Uh, and, and and this is true of uh, major writers too. And that is still uh, speaks to us even even after three centuries. So, which means that perhaps there is also, there can also be another idea of the new, and I would say that perhaps it is the, the that eternal newness in them that uh, makes them what, what we call immortal, but immortal is a big word, I don't think any, any right of the immortal be made. Maybe Shakespeare also make it for, for I'm not sure about that. But then at least for the time being, we, uh, we, we remember these major writers, major, not only major writers, major historians, but major musicians, major artists, because there, 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 is, there, is some, there is an element of newness in them which has survived. Even when all the externals of the newness have disappeared, because what made them, what made them uh, new in that particular period might, might, might have become old. But there is something in the spirit, something in the essence, something in the way they look at the world that continues to be new. So, what, so I, so this is, I mean, I'm trying to be a little more subtle, which means that there is a newness which is bound to history and to time. A newness that is worn out by time. And then, uh, the, the one, so, so, and, and for example, you, you can, if you want to distinguish that, you can even call it fashion. What is fashionable stays for a little while and then disappears. It doesn't la last. But what is new? Because that newness lies in the very perception, in the way. Uh, because of this new, uh, no, not because it was creating a new fashion uh, or a new movement called the cubism, again, of which he, uh, he was partly aware, yes. Uh, uh, but then uh, he, he, he tried to look at forms in a new way. That is, that is what really makes it new. He was looking at forms, forms in the form of forms and triangles and cubes. And that, that made, the, that, so the whole world was new then. If you look at the, look at the tree and the human being, the, the musician and the piano player, you know, all those, like uh, the, the three women, all those great paintings of Picasso. If you look at them uh, 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 um, now, you will find that what, what survives in them is that absolutely new way of representing reality. A new, and, and the representation comes from a new way of looking at reality. But that, that newness is the newness that is going to survive. Even then, because of, now you can say because of become late, and even old artists, and that, so many artists have come. But still, we go back to because of. We, we, we go back to uh, Dubai, we, we go back to uh, you know, Cezanne, and, and many of those artists, and also many of the uh, important Indian artists, even now, because uh, they had different ways of looking at the world. Cezanne's a tree was a different tree, and then Montreal came to the, again, a very different kind of tree. Uh, so the same tree looked at by, uh, say, someone like uh, Rousseau, uh, someone like uh, Cesar, and someone like Montreal. Now these were three different, uh, three, uh, three different trees, three different ways of looking at, uh, looking at the tree. And, and that is what remains, uh, you know, that, that's what makes it uh, constantly new, right? <laughs> I'm taking an example from art because you seem to know that a little better. Uh, so, so this can be, uh, this is the point. So that, that the newness that lasts, the newness of perception, there is a newness that too becomes old, and the newness on the surface, uh, the, the, the superficial kind of newness, where that gets old and lost. But what is new within the news? So this instance of going back, where old also becomes new or remains new, would you then agree that one can define newness or avoid newness with relevance? New is what is relevant, what remains relevant. What is relevant? Relevant. relevant. Yeah, relevant. Um, yeah, relevant also uh, has many dimensions. Socially relevant, aesthetically relevant. So, uh, in one sense, yes. Especially for a student of art, for a student of literature, 
uh, uh, what is new is what is relevant, from which he can still, he or she can still learn, uh, can, uh, which, uh, which is still seems to offer, you know, new, a new way of looking at things. So, yeah, one can also say that it is in that sense uh, aesthetically uh, relevant. Even, even if, uh, it's also my job, uh, I mean, it's okay. even then it has some kind of aesthetic relevance because you learn, uh, you learn a lot from its structures, from the way that the faces are, uh, I mean, used or the, or the colors are deployed. Uh, yeah, how would you place uh, these pulp fiction writers writing in English today, people such as Chetan Bhagat? Uh, yeah. Well, all these ultimately in socialism, all of them have some kind of value. I cannot deny that. Because they also must be answering a kind of need. A kind, for example, a kind of the, a neo literate, for example, who has to, in the sense of somebody who has just learned English. He needs such a reference, I believe. Many of us must have started their, you know, um, reading with the detective fiction and all that, and gradually we mature. But my only fear is that if you remain with Chetan Bhagat all through your life, uh, maybe there is something, something, something wrong. Uh, there is no harm in uh, beginning with uh, Chetan Bhagat, but unfortunately, uh, well, no, I, I should not be taking names, but you know, this is, this is a, I, I use it as a symbol, as a symbol of uh, what a lot of people seem to love. Because if you have gone to the Jaipur festival, uh, I have invited every year, I find a lot, especially a lot of uh, boys and girls from uh, uh, plus two waiting for Chetan Bhagat signatures. But I do not find many grown ups waiting, which I think is a, is a sign of health. <laughs> So, please, please, so, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't play in the boys and girls, but for them he is something, he is uh, also trying to address their world, the, the IT world and all the new world, uh, which uh, is yet to find its uh, real, uh, you know, uh, representative. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps this new world requires a greater, more philosophical, deeper kind of, uh, you know, somebody who can represent it, articulate it uh, deeply, uh, like Dostoevsky would do or Kassan Saki would do, but that has not happened and until then, well, okay, let's tell them that also. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, sir. The talk it was clarifying on unicorns, nicely mapping the whatever could be seen as the historical map. Uh, I only have one concern to raise in front of you, that is uh, this this civilizational grounds on which. You know, that the circulation of ideas, images, symbiosis, everything that, you know, allows for this meeting of various friends and various historical moments. And definitely we need to take cognizance of that. But using the adjective Indian, that seems to be always this risk of running into the, on the one hand, the status project, and on the other hand, this always waiting in the wings cultural mindfulness project with its own package of nature. So, how, how, for example, like in the case of Europe, the idea of European with both Catalan and the Red Army actually side seems to be both post nation and seems to be offering a kind of a throwback to antiquity. But so, how do we do that? How do we, you know, kind of Plant the edge of this objective degree as something that. Yeah, I, 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 exactly, I was trying to say that you know we need to emphasize the uh, federal nature of effort. You can say two questions. One, okay, you can completely negate the idea of India. That, 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 that in one way, there is no harm. Somebody can take that position. I would not say somebody should not take that position. Uh, but another way is uh, a new way of understanding, not a new way of understanding India as uh, understand, taking into account uh, its diversity and uh, making your mission the, the maintenance of that great uh, diversity. By which I mean ethnic diversity, religious diversity, uh, and uh, the diversity of various cultures and uh, uh, forms of expression. So once, once you, because our battle, I think, is against a monolithic idea of India. 
the monolithic idea of India, which is the orientalist India on the one hand, and also the India of the cultural nationalists and the revivalists on the other. And so there is there is a need to find that understanding of India, and this can be fought only by an alternative paradigm where we say that India there is nothing like a single Indian culture, there is nothing like a single Indian literature. Maybe we have different literatures, different languages, and different cultures across the country. Even though we have, our, by our own choice, decided to stand together as a country, that is the, that is the, that is the choice that the people have made. And as long as they have made, uh, India will India will stay together. But the, uh, the, the the fact is that we need to uh, we need to emphasize uh, this diversity, this great plurality. And also complicate it further, which is happening today. When Ganesh Devi makes a survey of Indian languages, there is a recent survey. So he has questioned, for example, the idea of a linguistic state. I mean, he has not done it, he has not questioned it directly, but, but uh, that is the undercurrent. Because he has found that uh, in, in, uh, in Assam there are 55 languages, and, uh, and, 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 he, has, and he has mapped. Uh, States like that, each state having 30, 35, 40, 50 languages. Even though we would think that Assam has only Assamese, Bengal has only Bengali, Kerala has only Malayali, uh, Malayalam language. But then, in you know, all the states, he has uh, discovered there are so many languages. So that is one way of uh, make, uh, making the idea of plurality even more complex. Because uh, we have some idea of plurality, but we need to make it more complex. Or, for example, look at the Northeast. In all our references, I keep saying everywhere, in, in our ideas of India, no keys to sell them up here. Assam sometimes does, because the Vaishnavite culture was there to, uh, up to Assam and Manipur. But beyond that, if you if you go to Meghalaya, you go to uh, Arunachal Pradesh, and have, have they been represented in our understanding of India at any time? When you speak of Indian art, Indian literature, Indian music, uh, Indian uh, tradition, Indian religion, have we thought of uh, these several religions which exist uh, among, among the uh, various types of uh, tribes uh, in these places? Uh, have we thought of the various languages? Another Pradesh has 90 languages that what Ganesh uh, says. So, have we thought of these languages as also Indian languages? And when we say that Ramayana and Mahabharata are all over, uh, can you say that Arunachal uh, Pradesh and Meghalaya, uh, they have a tradition of Ramayana at all? Or do they have their own different epics? So, so this is how we need to really problematize the idea of India. Not that I will not say giving up the idea of India. We need to problematize it regularly and constantly and ask, exactly, ask again and again what is India. I used to say that about the left. <laughs> the idea of the left should be problematized every time. Instead of saying that the present left is the left, we should say, are, are they the left or what, what does left mean? So, so we need to really, I mean, so this happens in politics and this happens everywhere. We need to, we need to ask ourselves again, instead of accepting anything as final, we need to ask this question again and again. What is exactly the, the, the idea of India? And so we need to reinvent. Uh, uh, the complexity of India in newer and newer ways, and that is the only way of uh, keeping this diversity alive and uh, uh, keeping uh, the dog at bay. Uh, I want to have a more clarity about this uh, idea of uh, modern literature. Uh, and, uh, Something that is rather vaguely described as progressive, you say. Uh, something as colonial, something uh, uh, not so very clearly defined. Modern, as far as modern is concerned, we define it in terms of modernist forms. Modernist forms. But my, my trouble always had been that social realism as well as a country like India is a modern form. So why are we not uh, you know, including social realism, most say Russian revolution, uh, progressive writers association, uh, you know, to so many others uh, are not included in this modernist uh, activity. Yeah, this is in fact uh, this is a problem of categories. Uh, I believe that fiction itself is new in India. 
except for uh, maybe Barnabas Kadabari or something, uh, we didn't have much of a tradition of fiction. You know, Japan perhaps has some, uh, has some tradition. Uh, so uh, there are many things uh, which which have been new. Everything has been new in a sense. Even uh, living and so on and all those things which uh, came for the first time. Then we began to write uh, prose dramas uh, because we had many verse dramas. Uh, we, were creating, we were in some sense creating something new. And this ideologically speaking, definitely, uh, you know, the, the uh, literature of the, the, the progressive period, you know, the art of the progressive period, even, even when I say this, it is a little vague. Because progressive, progressive arts, artists association is a very different from the progressive writers association. Because they are progressive also in that modern form, uh, you know, what the progressive artists association is. Uh, it it, it meant it may, it may an innovation of form, but for the progressive writers, there was an innovation of language, but the emphasis was on uh, you know, addressing the social reality in, in a progressive fashion. By progressive fashion, they meant uh, uh, having a kind of ideal society in mind, comparing the real, so the, uh, real society with that ideal society, and then critiquing the real society from the point of view of that ideal society, which for them was in the future, which for the revivalists uh, is in the past, like uh, an utopia of the past and utopia of the future. Uh, so we, the, 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 the cultural nationalists would say that this utopia is in the past and we need to revive that utopia, while the progressive would say this utopia in the future and we need to create that utopia uh, out of the out of the people's struggles. So definitely progressive literature uh, in, in that in that ideological sense was new and in fact elsewhere in a, in a longer piece on progressive literature I have also tried to say that it, can, it, it was new not only because of its ideology but if you now look at uh, the land at that time people were not very conscious of these elements, the language they used. For the first time that even though now we say there is a problem, but in fact in many of the writers the progressive period you find the language of the slum the language of the uh, the, of the, the backyard of the city where the poor people lived uh, came to be used and, and, it, uh, and they were going against the literary injections. In my language, for example, uh, one of the first events of progressive movement for the publication of a collection called Anjichitakar, five bad stories. The authors themselves called it bad stories because they were actually questioning the understanding of a good story. Uh, because they were writing about sex workers, they were writing the stories of the poor beggars uh, and uh, sick and the poor people, the marginalized people, and so uh, for, uh, they knew already uh, though they were anticipating the social prejudice when they called them five bad stories because they knew the existing uh, uh, conventional critics would say that these are bad. So why, why don't we do that uh, uh, already even before they have a, uh, they have that tribe. Uh, uh, the, the time to say that they 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 uh, painting you know very well you know foes they were called the wolves by the critics but then the, they said yes we are the wolves and they and their movement is a thing to be known the post depression movement is a thing to be known as poison so like that here they anticipated it and they called them uh, the bad stories so they were bringing in new for uh, uh, new um, uh, kinds of life into literature but to represent that new life they also came to know naturally the old language was not enough so you find the language of the uh, of the Dalit, the language of Islam, etc., being used for the first time uh, by some of these writers, uh, like uh, you know, uh, Prabhupada did that in Hindustani, and so did you know Takari or Bashir in Malayalam, and quite a lot of other writers in different uh, Indian, Indian languages. So they are also, uh, you know, but the emphasis was on the ideology and the outlook, and so we did not uh, really see. Uh, that they were also innovating in the process, they were also innovating the language and the idiom. Only very recently, as in uh, Premada Gobal's work on progressive literature, especially on the work on progressive Urdu literature, she's looking at Mr. Chuktai and uh, Sarathas and Mando and some of those uh, progressive writers, uh, and there she has also looked at this aspect the structural uh, uh, innovation, the innovation of imagination and the innovation of a medium. Perhaps this time, as you very well suggested, that we look at those aesthetic aspects of the progressive uh, uh, literature and progressive movement also.
because uh, uh, you know, it's more that we need to escape from uh, the disease of contentism. That is looking at the content only and speaking only of the content. But the content is never uh, renewed, alone. They never, they don't do it because they don't exist. Because they don't exist separately. The content and the form, they do not exist separately. They, 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 in our they are still organic unity. And, and in order to bring the new content, you have to break the existing form and, and, and change that. Without that, you cannot do that. And now people are trying to at least look at uh, the way, the form or in a way, in the process of uh, bringing in new content. I want to ask you uh, two questions. Uh, why do you, basically, both of them have to do with the notion of multiplicity or infinity. That you, you began with this uh, with, by speaking of the Ramayanas and the idea of many Ramayanas. And in that context, I want to ask you what is the nature of uh, generic uh, innovation? Right? Because even the people who are breaking with some monolithic notion of the Ramayana are, are working within a certain kind of frame a certain kind, a set of restrictions that define the limits of what they can do from within the Ramayana. That is to say that even if there are many Ramayana, I mean, the, the multiplicity does not, uh, does not mean, I'm wondering, does not mean that they, they, there is a complete uh, artistic license to play with the Ramayana in, in any which way. So when generic innovation of the kind happens, where you have many different kinds of Ramayana, what exactly is the nature of that? The second uh, point has to do with uh, when you say that Indian literature is multiple, how are we doing something different from uh, traditional European compared literature? As you know, since the last 10, 20 years, since Sahin and Spivak and so on, there has been this general understanding that the old style Eurocentric compared literature is no longer relevant, that compared literature has to open itself to other uh, languages and other literatures. Now, in response to the Eurocentrism, are we simply uh, giving them another panoply and another a host of different languages and literatures, or is there something happening within the context of Indian literature which is different from compared literature as in the old paradigm? So, in both those instances, what is the uh, what is the productive notion of uh, infinity that one can work on, or infinity or diversity that one can work with? Your first question, even when you say that uh, you cannot play freely with the Ramayana, I have a feeling that that's exactly what uh, our uh, uh, writers and artists have done. They have been playing freely, except that the names are there. Yeah, they are on the Ramayana, the but they have meant to many very, very different things to people who, like, like as I said, for the, uh, for the woman who, who writes her Ramayana. Or the Dalit who writes uh, uh, Mahabharata. So they, these are uh, uh, completely new and their meanings get completely changed. So it is really they are working, not, they are not working within a paradigm. There is, there is a basic kind of narrative. There, is, there, are, there are some products of classical imagination which they are trying to rework. And the limits of any reworking, definitely they also experience. I will definitely say, because reworking always has a, uh, it, is, it is limited by what is being reworked on, what is uh, what, what, yeah, what being reworked. And, and that is definitely added. But then, that, that it's not done only to the epics. There is a kind of a, uh, re, rewriting or reworking being done all through. In, uh, in, uh, in art, uh, see, when Mona Lisa gets a mustache, uh, you know, that it, it's also a kind of reworking, but Mona Lisa is still there, but Mona Lisa is not there too. Because it is no more the Mona Lisa that, uh, that, uh, that she was before. And so it's quite possible that uh, the, the, even the reworking can be a kind of, uh, very, can be very radical. There can be a very radical kind of uh, reworking. So if you look at Ramayanas, you will find uh, there are uh, uh, some Ramayanas, but there are only very small and subtle ships, but some others uh, there are very radical, you know, interrogative uh, kind of uh, transformations that, uh, that, that, that and about, about the comparative uh, perspective, yes, I think in India we have not yet fully developed an independent methodology for uh, comparative literature uh, because unfortunately our comparative literature departments for which the first model was Yadavpur University meant to be comparative literature comparing Indian texts with European texts. 
And this is what uh, later scholars like Shri Kumar Das, for example, began to question. But at least recently, a lot of scholars, I can name quite a few, uh, have begun to rethink that kind of a paradigm. It's <laughs> easy, so you will take a Bengali writer and compare him or her with a French writer. And so, and, and that happened a lot uh, here also in, 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 in research in Hindi departments, it happened a lot within India also. So he, you would say, so it's an one and one and two. So easy to produce a nature, you know, take eight lines from here, eight from here. See, so that happened a lot. But that, but that I think is not a very fruitful extra, that kind of advice. So perhaps we need to go deeper into uh, you know uh, individual texts and then uh, try, try to look at the various kinds of uh, cultural elements that go into the making of that particular text, the linguistic elements, the cultural elements, the milieu, the memory, the, the, more, the way in which imagination works in that text, and then uh, try to look at it, uh, to look at another text uh, uh, which uh, may apparently have a kind of common theme and all that, and yet uh, it is represented so differently, uh, differently there. So, uh, and that, that's why I said in the end, so as I said, uh, Bhakti texts or are Bhakti texts uh, in a sense. But then, uh, is so different from Akka Mahadevi, who is very, very conscious of the feminine self and feminine body. Uh, so that makes uh, her poetry so different. And even Akka Mahadevi and Mira Bhai are very different. The way they structure language, the way they, uh, the way they express their, uh, their uh, devotion. So, so, if you look at the modes of imagination, the modes of articulation, and the uh, various kinds of cultural elements that go into the making of a text, and then uh, compare, maybe it may be a little different from uh, this kind of a very, uh, very superficial kind of uh, you know, comparison that we very often uh, tend to make. It's not a complete answer, but I just make it
ചോരയിലുണ്ടൊരു സൂര്യൻ കുങ്കുമ ഗന്ധം ചിതറി ചെങ്കനും ചുറ്റും ചിതറി കത്തും തരുന്നാരുണ ചഞ്ചല സൂര്യൻ എൻ കണ്ണുകളിലുണ്ടൊരു സൂര്യൻ നീലി മൈമൈലി ഉറപ്പി നീലപ്പീലി വിടുത്തി നൃത്തം ചെയ്യും പേരവ നീല സൂര്യൻ എൻ അസ്ഥിയിലുണ്ടൊരു സൂര്യൻ മഞ്ഞ ജ്വാല ഉറുക്കി മജ്ജ ഇരുക്കി ഉരുക്കി മങ്ങിത്തെറിയും ഒരിത്തിരി മഞ്ഞ സൂര്യൻ എൻ നാടിയിലുണ്ടൊരു സൂര്യൻ പുണ്ണു പിടിച്ചു വെളുത്തും കണ്ണിമ കൂടി നരച്ചും കൂനി വിറച്ചു വിടത്തു തളർന്നൊരു വെള്ള സൂര്യൻ എൻ പ്രാണനിലുണ്ടൊരു സൂര്യൻ മരണം പോലെ കറുത്തും മഞ്ഞു കണക്കു തണുത്തും ശൂന്യതയുടെ ഗന്ധം ഉണ്ടാവിയ ശ്യാമള സൂര്യൻ ഇതിനോസ് <laughs> It is blue feathered south spread. In my bones is a sun, a little yellow sun, dim discovered and melting this marrow in to pour forth the yellow glow. In my nerves is a sun, a pale white sun, a hunchback in trouble, his eyes grey, his soul is leprous white. In my soul is a sun, a dark black sun, smelling of emptiness, cold as snow, dark as death. So, Uh, somebody said this is like pop art so <laughs> i don't know what i am going to do it and it pity na it is something i'll be in some reason what uh these two points were inspired by it. two events that happened in Turkey recently as a part of the democratic movement there some of you who know perhaps that in in June last, last June Erdem Gundos who is a choreographer he, he is a young man but before uh, decided to break the ban uh, and uh, stand in a park where demonstrations were uh, proscribed and he just came and stood there with his uh, hands in pockets for a long while, eight hours continuously and uh, hearing that somebody is standing there like this uh, hundreds of young people came and stood there uh, because they, they came to know it mostly through Facebook messages and uh, SMSs and all that and that became a kind of major demonstration, protest demonstration in, uh, in, in Istanbul, in the Gezi Park and the other thing happened in, in Taksim Square, again in Istanbul where again in a in a square where meetings you were not allowed to hold meetings and processions so there a young man and a young woman came and and started kissing and again knowing about this thousands of men and women came and began kissing and that became a new form of popular protest and uh, in these points i'm looking at these and trying to create a metaphor of on poetry from these two events the standing man a man still silent stands in the park where demonstrations are forbidden he is going nowhere nowhere is he coming from the world passes before him and time behind him in between with no flags or slogans he stands still silent the world moves with the sun and he multiplies becomes a hundred becomes a thousand hands in pockets they just stand still silent this is a nation in war a nation that stands stands up against injustice a glimpse of the future seen in a lightning flash a man stands in the park still silent the sun goes round him poetry is a man standing alone in a forbidden place a man real man is a human being poetry is a human being standing alone in a forbidden place and the second is the kiss 
You didn't believe when the boy said, the world changes when two people kiss. Tell your past as lives like that. See them, a man, a woman, they kiss. Not a man and a woman, but many men, many women. In the same square where the enforcers of law and of morals used to frown together if ever they walked hand in hand. A man, a woman, many men, many women, in the square, once a prison to every kiss. They are breaking the law, the present's law of death. They are making the law, the future's law of life. Poetry is a private kiss provocatively exchanged in a public space. Mm, uh, this is a poem for uh, your own Sharmila, you wanted me to read it. It's called Yes. Uh, I hope I did not tell students about Hero Sharmila and her great struggle against the draconian uh, rule. Um, this, this is Sharmila speaking. It has been translated also in the Manipuri by my friend Robin Gambo, who read it out to Hero. Yes. My body is my flag at half mast. My water comes from tomorrow's river. My bread from the village kitchen. In my brain is a bullet, green like a fireball and spat. My name is the last letter of my ancient language, the final answer to every riddle, the moral of every proverb, the goal of every magic chant, the ominous truth of every oracle. My life leaves me every day, and every day it comes back like a bird that survives the hunters to return to its nest with the order of the forest rain. In the night, emptied of the morning's greetings and the evening's prayers, I lie alone under one desolate star like the broken bench in an abandoned village tea shop, holding on still to the warmth and order of yesterday's visitors. I have forgotten now that a nameless flower once seen in a flash on a village hillock. My childhood lies sunk in the sand like the paper boat parted by the heavy rain. My poems are the autumn's last yellow leaves. My kids turned into vapor by the echoes of rifle reports will come down heavily as a rain of blood over those soldiers of hell. I won't be there. But my hope will be a word from the mountain that has a need to be too fed. A poem from the woods no boots can crush. An alphabet of steel no violet can pierce. A purple hibiscus, my manipul heart ever in bloom. <laughs> Burned poems. Uh, I am making a reference to a lot of women poets here. The Bhakti poets, Andal and Akra Mahadevi, poets like Kamala Das, uh, Sylvia Plath, uh, Shimboska, and finally to Saf, who was an lesbian, you know. Burnt poems. I am a half burnt poem. Yes, you get to write a girl's love poem. Girl's love poems have seldom escaped the fire. Father's fire, brother's fire, even mother's an heirloom. Only some girls half escape. Those half charred ones we call Sylvia Plath, Anna Amatova, or Kamala Das. Some girls to escape fire hide their desire under the veil of devotion. Thus is born a Meena, an Anna, a Mahadevi Akka. Every nun is a burning love poem addressed to the ever young Jesus. I had in mind those nuns in brown uh, uh, you know, uh, mantles. Uh, every nun is a burning love poem addressed to the ever young Jesus. Rarely, very rarely, a girl learns to love at the world with that tender affection only women are capable of. Then the world names her Miss Baba Shimborska. Of course, Safo, she was saved only as her love poems were addressed to women.
Dante and poetry. One day, a new poem reached Dante's ashram to have a glimpse of the man. Dante, spinning away his thread towards Ram, took no notice of the poem, waiting at his door, ashamed as he was in Hajar. The poem cleared his throat, and Gandhi looked at him sideways through those glasses that had seen hell. Have you ever spun thread? He asked the poem. Ever pulled a scavenger's cart? Ever stooped the smoke of an early morning kitchen? Have you ever starved? The poem said, I was born in the woods, <coughs> in a hunter's mouth. A fisherman brought me up in his hamlet. You know, Vyasa was the son of a fisherman. Even though people say only he was the son of a sage. The poem said, I was born in the woods, in a hunter's mouth. But me, a fisherman brought me up in his hamlet. Yet I do no work, I only sing. First I sang in the courts, then I was plump and handsome. But I am on the streets now, half starved. That's better, Gandhi said with a sly smile. But you must give up this habit of speaking in science. <laughs> Go to the fields, listen to the peasant's speech. The poem drove you a dream and lay waiting in the fields for the tiller to come and upturn the virgin soil moist with new rain. The man, the man as a poem of the man, I have a lot of people who are supposed to be mad in my family and I often felt I understood them much better than my same religious. <coughs> the man, the man they have no caste, no religion. They transcend gender, live outside ideologies. We do not deserve their innocence. Their language is not of dreams, but of another reality. Their love is moonlight. It overflows on the full moon day. Looking up, they see gods we have never heard of. They are shaking their wings when we fancy they are shrugging their shoulders. They hold, even flies have souls, and a green god of grasshoppers leaps up on thin legs. At times they see trees bleed, hear lions roar in the streets. At times they watch the heaven gleam in a kitten's eyes, just as we do. But they alone can hear ants sing in a chorus. While packing the air, they are claiming a cyclone over the Mediterranean. With their heavy tread, they stop a volcano from erupting. They have another measure of time. Our century is their second. 20 seconds, no, you should say, 21 seconds, and they reach Christ. Six more, they are at the Buddha. In a single day, they reach the Big Bang at the beginning. They go on walking restless for their earth is boiling still. The man are not man like us. I can stop any time. <laughs> Stammer. Stammer is no handicap. It is a mode of speech. Stammer is the silence that falls between the word and its meaning. Just as lameness is the silence that falls between the word and the deed. Did Stammer precede a language or succeed it? Is it only a dialect or a language itself? These questions make the linguists Stammer. Each time we Stammer, we are offering a sacrifice to the goal of meanings. When a whole people stammer, stammer becomes their mother tongue, just as it is with us now. God too must have stammered when he created man. That's why every word of man carries different meanings. That's why everything he utters, from his prayers to his commands, stammers like poetry.
a man with a door. I found a man walking with a door frame along the road at this point. Okay, what is that? A man walks with a door along the city street. He is looking for his house. He has dreamt of his woman, children and friends coming in through the door. Now he sees a whole world passing through this door of his never built house. Men, vehicles, trees, bees, birds, everything. And the door, its dream rising above the earth, longs to be the golden door of heaven. <coughs> Imagines clouds, rainbows, demons, fairies and saints passing through it. But it is the order of hell who awaits the door. Now it just yearns to be its tree full of foliage, swaying in the breeze, just to provide some shade to its owner's order. A man walks with a door along the city street. A star walks with him. I'll end with uh, this poem and then another. This poem. Self is strong. My mother didn't believe when, in 1945, I appeared to her in a dream and told her I would be born to her the following year. My father recognized me as soon as he saw the mold below my left thumb. But mother believed to the very end that someone else had been born to her masquerading as me. Father and I pleaded to pleaded with her, but her dreams cannot be relied on. She went on waiting for that promised son till she died. Only when she was reborn as my daughter did she admit that it had really been me. But by then, I had begun to doubt it was someone else's heart that was beating within my body. One day, I will retrieve my heart, my language too. Something like a folk song. It doesn't follow any folk song tune, but it uh, yeah, sounds like a folk song. I first read its uh, transition, not a transition, it would suggest its meaning. It, you know, uh, in our uh, parts of uh, Kerala, there is uh, there's a celebration called Bharani in Kudunilu, where uh, uh, roosters used to be sacrificed. Later, that was banned, and so they hold it aloft and they fly it, uh, um, they just uh, fly it. Uh, otherwise, uh, later, you know, they have a <laughs> they hold it auction. They, they hold it and then they say, uh, people come and uh, take it. So here is a man who is holding a rooster in the hand and telling the people, you can come and take it. But when he looks at each part of the bird, he falls in love with uh, each part, the beautiful <coughs> and the, you know, the, uh, the flower and all that, and so the box school. So and then he says, okay, take it, but give me only that part. Uh, that, that's how the whole point uh, Finally, he says, okay, you take it, but give me the rooster. Uh, so, how so, okay, can we interpret it in many ways? You know, some, some people are like, <laughs> uh, speaking to the critics. You analyze my poem, you do a rare, write essays and all that, but please keep my poem in that after all that. Or it can be, a, a, you know, some of those benefactors in contemporary society who pretend that they are giving up everything while they keep uh, everything valuable for themselves. So, in, in translation, it looks like this. Uh, carry away my rooster, share it among yourselves, but give me back that knife-sharp beak. Carry away my rooster, share it among yourselves, but give me back that cock spoon of copper, those eyes red and black like kumi seeds. Kumi is a kind of ripper. Carry away my rooster, share it among yourselves, but give me back those golden legs, those toast like sesame flowers, those silver green nails. Carry away my rooster, share it among yourselves, but give me back that trunk like a little drum, that throat that sounds like a conch, that liver that blows like a pipe, those guts that shape a liar. Carry away my rooster, share it among yourselves, but give me back those wings like banana leaves, those feathers like coconut blooms, that tail like tender pineapple shoots, that mating that scattered the sparks, that pop fight with its virgin banner. Carry away my rooster, share it among yourselves. Oh yes, you can have the rooster's horns, you can have his teeth, have to the rooster's egg, the rooster's breasts as well. Carry away my rooster, share it among yourselves. But give me back, give me back, just my rooster, just his <laughs> It sounds like this.